Let's get into the Word of God this morning, man. And uh, I have a word I want to share. I'm not going to preach real long. It's Mother's Day. I know we got, you want to get with mom and uh, do all the things we're doing on Mother's Day today. But I have something burning in my spirit I want to get into today. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16. And I'm going to be talking on this idea of more than a song. Everybody say more than a song. Say it one more time, more than a song. I'm going to read this story. You've probably, this is one of those Sunday school stories you've probably heard before from the Bible. If not, maybe it'll be new, but either way, you can follow in the version Bible app or on the screen. Here we go. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 30. It says, her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the, mar- uh, dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer... I hate, I hate when the, the, I need to find scriptures that are all on one page. The jailer ordered to make sure they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake. And the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped. (coughs) So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. Verse 29, the jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this moment. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for our moms without whom we would not be here today, God. And we thank you for the chance and the moment that we share in the calendar, God, to honor and and just recognize them and and take a little special time with them. God, we bless them today. Lord, I pray you bless your word, Father. I pray your word will come alive in our soul. Holy Spirit, that you will speak to us, God, beyond what is simply on the page, beyond just some ideas or some thoughts. But Lord, I pray that we will have an encounter with you, Lord, that helps us take the next step that you've called us to take in our life and our faith with you in Jesus' name. In fact, everybody, why don't you put your hand on your belly somewhere. Repeat this after me. Pray with me. Say this. Say, Jesus, speak to me today. Open up my eyes. Open up my ears. Let me see what you want me to see. Let me hear what you want me to hear so I can do what you want me to do and be everything you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, I don't know about you, but if you came through Sunday school or raised in church, again, you probably have heard this story before. And uh, honestly, the version of this story that I heard, I, I've began to see this a little differently over the last uh, over the last little bit as I've begun to look at this. Because the version of the story that I remember from this hearing is that Paul and Silas were so overwhelmed with joy as they sat in prison after being beaten and whipped and bloodied and thrown in chains, yet their, their faith was so strong that they were just so overjoyed at the moment, just in spite of everything that they went through, that they found a way to praise God. How many have heard some sort of version of that story when it comes to Acts chapter 16? Like, like the joy of the Lord is so powerful, and it is, is so powerful that that regardless of what's happening around you, regardless of the uh, of what's going on, you can find joy and, and you should praise and you should lift up your voice. And, and here's the thing. I just, I'm beginning to question how realistic that interpretation of this story is because you need to understand something. Paul and Silas, if you read the, the, the chapter, the whole chapter, just to break down what's happening, Paul and Silas have done everything right. In fact, in this chapter, the Bible says that Paul was actually planning on going to another city to preach the gospel, and he was actually interrupted by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him in a dream and said, no, I want you to go to this place instead. And so Paul and Silas obey the Holy Spirit. They do exactly what God told them to do, and when they get there, the the, the, the moment that leads to this beating and then being thrown into prison is the Bible says that as they were going around the town in the marketplace preaching the gospel, 
gospel. God was doing miracles. Amazing things were happening. The Bible says there was this, one, this girl who was possessed by an evil spirit. She was a slave, and she began to walk around shouting about how great Paul and Silas were, but Paul and Silas recognized that it really wasn't a godly thing. It was a demonic spirit. And so the Bible says that basically Paul got frustrated, turned around after a few days of this, of being interrupted by this demonic spirit, rebuked the spirit, cast the devil out of this slave girl, and the Bible says that her owners then became very upset because they used this girl's bondage, they used the demonic oppression in this girl's life to tell fortunes and to raise money and to make money. And so the Bible says once they realized their hope of money was gone, they, they got all upset. But then the Bible says that Paul, this is, listen, Paul and Silas were beaten. The Bible says severely beaten. How many know God's word doesn't throw adjectives in there that aren't just, that, that this is not just, God doesn't just color the language so it's better to read. If the Bible says they were severely beaten, it means they took a beating. They were bloodied. They were bruised. And they were thrown into prison. Not just thrown in jail, but the Bible says they were put in stocks and chains and put into the inner part of the cell, which means they didn't have an outside wall. Basically, they were kind of thrown. In, <coughs> excuse me. In a lot of our modern prisons, they have what's called the shoe or the hole. They were kind of thrown into the hole. And there they are in chains, in stocks, bloodied, bruised, beaten, and also at the same time completely 100% obedient to everything God had told them to do. Now let's just get real for a second. Do you honestly believe in that moment they were so overjoyed with a sense of happiness and joy that they didn't have anything else to do but just praise God? Does that, does that I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe that's the truth. But here's the deal. We've got to read the Bible and understand that these are very real people, and the feelings that I would have felt and you would have felt are very likely the same feelings that they would have felt. And what we do a lot of times is we, we, put, these, we put these stories and we put these people up on pedestals, and, and we think that they were like superheroes and had some kind of superpower. But here's the problem. I don't have that superpower. Amen. And so I read this and I think, well, there's nothing for me to take away or, or man, I, how could I ever possibly live up to that type of example? How could I get my faith that strong that after somebody beats me and punches me and puts me in jail, after I've done everything right, how in the world am I supposed to just sit there happy, taking it, going, oh, man, life is so wonderful. Let's, let's sing some songs. Let's have a sing-along because life is so great while my nose is busted and my arms is bruised and I'm sitting in chains and stocks in the hole somewhere. Does that, that's not, I just, I don't know how realistic that interpretation is of what's going on. That Paul and Silas were just so super filled with the spirit that even after being beaten and bloody, they were like, let's, let's sing some songs. <laughs> He's coming like a freight train. Woo! Blood coming down the freight. I don't, I want to, I want to, I want to present a little bit more of a more realistic idea of what's probably happening in this moment. And this is what I believe it is. I don't believe that they were overjoyed or overwhelmed or thrilled or just overcome with a Holy Spirit inspired sense of joy and praise and thanksgiving because they had been beaten for preaching the gospel. I don't think that's necessarily what happened at all. I believe that probably what happened in the reason that they were singing songs and hymns and praying to God around midnight is because after they had been beaten, after they had been bloodied, after they had been put in chains, and after they had been thrown in the inner dungeon of this jail cell, I believe they probably recognized that the only thing that they needed, the one thing that they needed that more than anything else in their lowest moment, in their moment where, where man, I did everything right and still life has, has beat the heck out of me, the only thing that could get them through that moment was the presence of God. Amen? And because they needed God's presence in a greater way than they ever needed him before, they also understood this Old Testament scripture. And this is what the Bible says in Psalms. Psalms chapter 22, verse 3. <clears throat> in the New Living Translation, it says, You, O Lord, God of Israel, sit enthroned on the praises of Israel. 
The King James Version says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Okay? So they had this Old Testament truth. Here's what I believe Paul and Silas recognized. That in their lowest moment, when they had no way of escape and, and next to no hope, didn't know what was going on, they needed God's presence in a very real and tangible way, but they realized and recognized the truth from the Old Testament that God inhabits the praises of his people or that the presence of God dwells within the praises of his people. So since they needed his presence they had to create an atmosphere or a place of praise thereby giving God a place to come and dwell in the midst of them I don't believe even for a second that Paul and Silas were sitting there after being beaten and thrown in jail that they were just so happy at the opportunity to have the crap kicked out of them that they just had nothing else to do but sing a song no I believe out of desperation out of hurt out of pain and out of need they said we need the presence of God like we have never needed him before and the greatest way the most surefire way to get into God's presence is to create a place of praise because God's praise he inhabits his presence inhabits the praises of his people let me say it this way the space that I fill with my praise is the space that God fills with his presence amen somebody let me say that again. The space that I fill with my praise, with my worship, is the space that God fills with his presence. So if I need the presence of God, I need to find a place to praise. And I just, for the next few moments, want to set a few things straight and make sure that we are not confused and topsy-turvy about what singing and the song and worship is all about. Because I'm, I'm a little, I want to make sure that we don't get confused like Thor with his hammer. And I know that makes no sense, but I'm going to make it make sense in just a second. Okay. This is what I want to make very clear. Okay, what are you doing with this? Listen. Thor thought that he needed his hammer to have his power available. And what he recognized is that the hammer was not the source of his power. It was just a way for him to tap into it and to channel it. And it's the same way with our worship in the presence of God. Singing a song is not necessarily the presence of God. Amen? Amen? The goal when we come together in the worship and the idea when we say, man, when you have a need and you, and, and, and you need to get with God, worship, find a place of worship, find a place of praise. The goal of what Paul and Silas were doing was not simply singing a song because they were so overwhelmed and overjoyed with, with, with their situation in life that they decided let's just sing about how great God is right now. No, friend, worship, the song is just a way singing the, the praise is just a way for me to channel my worship and create a space for the actual power the presence of God to come and fill the area and the space in my life because the space that I fill with praise because God inhabits the praises of his people is the place that God will fill with his presence amen somebody so I want us to get real clear and make sure that we don't listen listen it's not about singing it's not about dancing it's not about a particular song it's about the presence of God and just like Thor used his hammer to channel his superpower we worship is just a way for us to channel our focus on God and create a place for his presence to fill amen somebody listen praise is the hammer the presence is the power amen somebody singing is not necessarily the presence of God amen listen listen quotable little little quips and and nice little things to think about it's not the presence of god simply learning more information is not the presence of god being a better person is not the presence of god 
Getting greater uh, knowledge and wisdom is not necessary. It's not bad things. Those are good things, but it's not the presence of God. Amen, somebody? Listen, fast songs and slow songs, neither one of those are the presence of God. Low lighting is not the presence of God. Hyped up, jumping around, dancing is not the presence of God. Those are all things, hopefully, to help us create a throne for his presence to move in, but we can't stop short at the stuff that is simply supposed to channel his presence and not have the presence. Amen. We need the presence of God. That is what changes everything. Amen, somebody. So so the whole point of what I want to challenge us with here is this. Don't just sing a song. Pursue the presence. Amen. When we, when we come together and we begin to worship, or when you turn a worship music or your favorite worship song on the radio or whatever it is, listen, don't just, don't just sing a song mindlessly. Friend, in that moment, we are pursuing the presence. And the reason that is so key, and we can't miss that, is because presence changes everything. Amen? It was not Paul and Silas's song that changed their situation. It was God's presence that filled their song that changed their situation. Amen, somebody? It wasn't them singing that shook the prison jail, that shook, shook the, 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 the doors open on the jail cell. <laughs> Sorry, I short-circuited for a second. It wasn't their song that shook the prison doors open and caused their chains to fall off. It was God's presence that inhabited their song that shook the prison doors and knocked their chains off. Amen? We can't stop short at just singing. we got to pursue the presence because the presence changes everything. It was the presence of God that changed their jailhouse into a church house. It's the presence of God that changes your place of bondage into a place of freedom. Come on, somebody. It is the presence presence of God that will change your place of beating into a place of blessing. Amen, somebody. That is for somebody today. I don't know where you've been defeated. I don't know where you've been bloodied. I don't know where you've been bruised. I don't know where you've been kicked around. I don't know where you've been thrown into a cell, but somebody needs to understand that God's presence wants to move on your life. Somebody at home needs to understand right where you are. God's presence wants to move on your life and turn your place of beating into a place of blessing. That's what God's presence will do for you. And that's why we can't stop short at just singing. We must pursue the presence. Everybody say the presence. This is how powerful God's presence is. Watch this. God's presence can change everything even when nothing changes at all. Notice this. Paul and Silas, everybody sitting in that jail cell, they all were in the exact same location they were just a few seconds before God's presence showed up. You follow that? Nothing about their physical location or their physical circumstances really change too much, and yet because of God's presence, everything changed, even though nothing from the outside really seemed to change. That's how important, that's how powerful God's presence is, that when I am in God's presence, listen, when I'm in God's presence, it, it changes everything. It changes my perspective. It changes how I see things. It changes how I can see the world. It changes everything, even when nothing around me changes whatsoever. You can be going through the exact same situation today and be going through the exact same thing tomorrow, but guess what? When you find a place of God's presence, when you build a, a throne of praise and worship around your life, not just singing a song, not just, not just going through the motions, but pursuing his presence, and God's presence shows up in your midst, 
all of a sudden, even though nothing changes, even though the bills are still the same, even though the balance in the bank account is still the same, even though the way you physically feel is still the same, you can have a sense of God's presence that changes everything about how you're walking through that season. God's presence changes everything, even <clears throat> when nothing changes. And I want you to see this too. Real freedom is found in God's presence. Watch this. The Bible says that every single prison door flew open. All of the chains fell off. And yet, not a single person in jail left that moment or left their room. Paul and Silas weren't the only people, only people in prison. There were plenty of guilty people there, probably people who deserved to be there, people who should have been there. And yet, given the opportunity, watch this, <clears throat> given the opportunity to leave their chains or stay in the place of God's presence, the Bible says that every single one of them chose God's presence. That's the only explanation for why a guilty person would choose to stay inside their prison cell given the opportunity to leave, is this. Because they recognize, many of them probably recognized real freedom in the presence of God for the first time. For the first time they realized that freedom was not a situational season or circumstance of life, but freedom was a person named Jesus. And when they came into the presence of the con and contacted the person of Jesus, they decided, you know what? I would rather be in God's presence with real freedom than outside of this jail cell without the presence of God because real freedom is found only in his presence. Amen? Chains in God's presence was more freeing than freedom without it. Which is why we have got to be pursuers of his presence. The Bible says it was the presence of God this was about to be this jailer's worst day of his life. We read it said that the jailer, when he woke up and realized that all the prison doors were open, he assumed that everybody had left. The Bible says he was about to take a sword out and kill him, so he said, why was he going to do that? Because in this Roman system, it was to be a jailer, to, you literally were... The part of the deal of being a jailer was you're taking responsibility for their life. And if they mess up, it's on you. The punishment that was on them is going to come on you. So the jailer said, man, I don't know what happened. I blew it. I'd rather die at my own hand than die the cruel death that, that, uh, uh, that the government had for these people. So he takes his sword out. He's about to kill himself. And Paul shouts, no, 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 no. We're all here. Don't do it. What made the presence of God? The presence of God that kept them there is the same presence of God that turned this jailer's what could have been his worst day into the greatest day of his life. Because in that moment, because the presence of God showing up in the building, because Paul and Silas were not just were not just mindlessly, randomly, haphazardly singing some songs as if the songs themselves had any power or magical ability, but they were pursuing his presence. So the jailer's day turned from a day where he was over and it was done to the day where he found new, fresh life in that presence of Jesus in Christ himself. The Bible says that when, when he comes to Paul and Silas, he says, what, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? The presence of God turned the jailer's day of suicide into a day of salvation. And I'm not going to take the time to read the rest of the story. The Bible says the jailer believes his whole family, his whole household gets saved, and every single one of them are baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of the presence of God that moved into the moment and changed everything. Not the singing, the presence. Come on, somebody. It wasn't the song. The song was simply the platform. The song simply created the space. His presence. That's what we want to do.
Stand all over his place this morning. You might be in this place this morning. And right now, the presence of Jesus is moving on your heart. 